Good morning, uh, Matthew. It's uh, nice uh, to be here and uh, talk to uh, your your uh, investors and clients. Uh, just a bit of background to myself. My name is Johan Wittendahl, Managing Director of Southern Palladium. Of course, Southern Palladium uh, uh, recently listed uh, on the Australian uh, Stock Exchange 8th of June of this year and simultaneously also on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. Uh, of course, we're a junior explorer, uh, specifically aiming at uh, the PGM market or the Platinum Group Metals market. And uh, quite exciting times for us uh, to be uh, in this space uh, at this point in time, in particular to take advantage of the uh, the uh, green economy and uh, also the demand for precious metals and in particular platinum, palladium, rhodium. Beautiful. Johan, I really good to have you on the show. It's the first time we've met or spoken. Um, it's a new story to us. It's a relatively new company as well. Um, here's the thing. I don't think... Most investors, retail, really understand the kind of palladium, platinum, and rhodium uh, market. Um, what, what do they need to know in terms of understanding the thesis as maybe something that's investable for them? So what, what can you tell us? Matthew, I think if you look at the platinum industry, uh, there are just uh, a few. You can literally count them on your hand in terms of, uh, of suppliers. And as I mentioned, uh, South Africa hosts uh, 72% of the world's PGMs. You're in uh, the, the so-called Bushveld uh, complex. And uh, in terms of production supply, 57% of the world's uh, uh, platinum group metals. So for us to be in South Africa in particular and on the eastern limb of a Bushveld complex put us in, uh, in a sweet spot and absolutely that we can take advantage of uh, the growing market. Right, okay, but, um, but it, it, give me a little bit more in terms of the the applications, the utility of, the, of PGMs, um, you know, and the size of those markets. Yeah, the, the uh, you know, if we're looking at the, at the PGM market and again at the three PGMs, uh, the market for, for platinum is in the order of uh, 6 million ounces, palladium uh, in order of 7 million ounces, and then rhodium about uh, 0.7. A million ounces. So those three metals are, of course, to a large extent, are used in uh, the uh, auto catalyst or the motor industry and uh, in uh, th- the application uh, thereof in auto catalyst in internal combustion engines. So if we look at uh, particular platinum, of course, the, plat- the, the use uh, and, and, and maybe just to say that the PGM uh, characteristics is so unique. You know, it is uh, a catalyst in, uh, and uh, uh, if we look at, at uh, platinum, for instance, platinum is, is to a large extent used in, in uh, its application uh, in diesel engines as uh, is used as, as a metal in the auto catalyst and then also in, in jewelry. Uh, so those are the two big applications. And then if we look at the uh, the rest uh, of a makeup, it's electronics, uh, glass industry, chemicals uh, that uh, platinum is used. If we look at, at uh, palladium, palladium t- t- to a large extent goes into uh, uh, autocatalyst uh, and in particular in, uh, in gasoline or petrol engines. Uh, I think that the percentage is in order of 73% of that goes into uh, the application uh, there are in auto catalysts. The other, of, of course, is also in jewelry. And uh, again, the, the makeup of, of demand very similar uh, as that of platinum. The other metal, rhodium, is, is also unique. Uh, you've probably seen the, uh, what the rhodium price did uh, over the past year or two, a significant increase uh, in, uh, in the rhodium price. And uh, rhodium, to a large extent, is in order of uh, 80%, 85%, is used in the uh, auto catalyst industry. Uh, I think that is sort of uh, the, the application and the use for it uh, at the moment. But if we look at, at long term and, and, and what are the dynamics, um, we will find that, uh, you know, and the question is, what is going to happen to PGMs uh, 10 years from now or 20 years from now? In particular, in the the uh, internal combustion engine, because we're starting to see electric vehicles coming into play, 
And uh, there's a big question about uh, uh, internal combustion engines. Now, what we've seen in the market in terms of forecasts, and uh, here we rely on, on various analysts that uh, give us a forecast for these um, uh, motor vehicle uh, uh, demand. Uh, and, and it seems that by 2030, there will be a decline in the use of internal combustion engines. But that uh, decline is made up, of course, with hybrid vehicles uh, on the one hand, and then also, of course, uh, the fuel cell vehicles that is slowly but surely tight, uh, starting to take, uh, uh, starting to get uh, 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 use or, or application into the market. Uh, so although they see a decline, there's, there's still, uh, I think in the longer term, and a lot of analysts even predict up to 2040 that we will still see internal combustion engines. Uh, the loading, uh, of course, in the catalyst will increase uh, through time. So all in all, if you look at that situation, we will see a steady growth uh, in demand for these uh, three PGMs going forward. Right, and, and what, what about price as well? Is, is there going to be a sustained price? Or is it, are we looking at creative growth in price? I mean, what, what happens to that? Matthew, we, if we look at uh, sort of the, the trend and what, what PGMs uh, done in the past couple of years, uh, you know, certainly uh, there was quite a depressed market in the industry, uh, you know, since 2008 when we saw a downturn up to around about 2018. Uh, during this time, of course, we haven't seen much uh, exploration from uh, uh, or happening in the in the industry, and also not any expansion uh, happen expansion uh, happening uh, from the bigger producers. So, uh, on the supply side, certainly uh, depressed uh, supply conditions, and uh, uh, well, what we've seen is, is in 2019, you know, demand started to pick up again. And uh, that placed uh, the market into a supply deficit and uh, quite a significant increase overall, in particular, the, the palladium and, and rhodium market. Now, looking at where we are at the moment, certainly I don't think we'll go back to the levels that we've seen uh, pre-2019, purely just because, you know, companies didn't make any money. Uh, back then, but uh, you know, uh, also what we've seen in the in in just uh, looking at our price basket, for instance, uh, uh, was prices coming down to levels where we see now sort of uh, you know stabilizing at at these levels, uh, and going forward, I think we can certainly see quite a steady. Uh, uh, or, a, or a stable market going forward. Okay, interesting. No, I appreciate that market update because, as I say, I don't think it's something that people uh, necessarily understand or, or see, see a lot. There's not, not too many companies um, focused on PGMs. So um, now we understand the opportunity ahead of us. Let's talk about the asset that you picked up. You're relatively new. You, you, you IPO'd um, you know, in the middle of this year. Um, how did you pick up, up the asset and uh, who from and what did it cost you? Well, the asset, uh, we actually uh, you know, have... Uh, Quite a long uh, relationship and history going back uh, to 2005, uh, 2006, when we picked up the assets. Uh, and uh, this was particular a community, the Wanyama community, who approached us to uh, apply for the for the asset. Uh, so uh, it it is a long uh, way back that we we uh, started to look at the asset picked it up uh, through basically the transformation from the old uh, Minerals Act to the new uh, Minerals Act in South Africa, where companies uh, had to reapply. And uh, we did the application uh, and uh, finally got the the right uh, granted back in June 2015. Um, it is important to note that, that uh, there is a community that... Uh, uh, reside on the on the property. Of course, this community, in terms of our shareholding, is a major partner, and um, and uh, for us, it's important, uh, you know, that we have this relationship with them and even improve our relationship going forward uh, with the community. Yeah, I think they're what nine percent shareholders, aren't they? Um, in sense, so so you, it used to be phrased when I was in banking days and and, and even um, working down in South Africa so it was, it was sort of um, the 
I think was that that's a sort of mandatory thing, is it? Or, or it is, that... It's yeah, it, it's it's called yeah. In South Africa, it's BEE or Black Economic Empowerment. Yeah, yeah, okay. uh, and, and that is sort of uh, yeah, that is a mandatory twenty six percent. Now, in our case, um, you know, our whole our whole transaction wasn't based just on on you know trying to fulfil that that twenty six percent BEE requirement, as this dates back or or this uh, 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 partnership dates back to to where we initially applied for the the prospecting rights, and the community, of course, came in as as a major partner. Right. And, and what about may, may I ask if you know? And with regards to the board and management team, you know, it talks about seventeen um, percent in there. Um, what's the what's the makeup of that in terms of who owns what at board or management level? Yes, if we look at at, at board level, uh, Southern Palladium, of course, uh, I think absolutely we've got a fantastic board. Uh, and uh, if we look at the makeup, uh, our chairman, Mr. Terence Goodlace, uh, a person with with many years' experience in the mining industry. Terence, of course, was previously a board member of Impala Platinum, the second largest producer of PGMs, and later on became the, the CEO of, of Impala Platinum. Terence currently serves on uh, various boards, uh, which includes Kumba and, and Goldfield. So uh, Terence, and our, as our chairman, brings to the board absolutely that, that in-depth experience that he had, and of course, on the, on the corporate governance side. All that experience as a board member of these, these big uh, big boards. Uh, then we uh, also have uh, three Australians uh, that's currently serving on the board. Mike Sturzacker, of course, Mike's uh, uh, experience in particular on the corporate finance side helped quite a bit with uh, you know putting the structure together and also with the listing. And then the other two Australian directors, very good experience in in mining. Uh, in particular, in in uh, starting new new productions, our other South Africans. We've got three Australians, uh, three South Africans. Our other South African, uh, Don van Heerden, uh, also excellent experience in the mining industry in South Africa in both underground and and uh, open cost. Now that's our SPD board. If we look then at our as seventy percent subsidiary, miracle upon miracle, and that is sort of a South African company. Um, Southern Palladium own, own 70% of MUM and, of course, the community, a direct 30% stake in, in MUM. And uh, on that board level, we've got a 50% uh, representation uh, with uh, myself there as CEO and uh, also Mike Sturzacker and Don van Heerden serving on board on that board. We also... Uh, have three members uh, from the community, uh, Advocate uh, Lindy Nkosi, who is uh, on the at, uh, in Johannesburg uh, as a uh, a um, uh, advocate, and then two community members on a, on the site itself. Right. Okay. Well, look, if you um, so, if you don't mind, can you sort of take us back to the the IPO in, in terms of like how much money did you raise at IPO? How much money have you raised in total so far? Yes, we we. Uh, uh, with the IPO and the listing, we raised uh, 19 million Australian dollars. And what we said with that uh, 19 million Australian dollars, what we want to do is 70% of that uh, amount we wanted to directly put back into the ground uh, in exploration and feasibility studies. And of course, what we want to do in this whole process um, and, and, and the intention with this capital raise was specifically to uh, upgrade the, the resource, uh, increase the, uh, our confidence level in, in the resource, and uh, complete a feasibility study, a res uh, declare a reserve, and then finally do a mining right application um, uh, into the DMRE. The Department of Mineral Resources. Now that that 19 million, uh, we said we wanted to spend over a two-year period, so from June 2022 up to uh, June uh, 2024. So that was sort of our our two-year period uh, for this exploration program. Um, what we've seen uh, in in recent times is, of course, that we can start to 
uh, bring some of the um, items that we want to complete uh, or, or uh, forward. And uh, and if we look at our drilling, our drilling, uh, we want to complete around about uh, June, July of 2023. We're slightly behind with our drilling, about a, a month, a month and a half. Uh, but we recently sat with a contractor and see how we could uh, improve the uh, productivity of a drilling company and also by uh, bringing more draw rigs on, onto the ground. Then, of course, we will uh, uh, early next year kick off with a feasibility study. And what we are looking at now is uh, to already do our mining right application by the end of 2023. So uh, we, we believe that we can reduce that two-year period to more or less 18 months. Okay, and, and tell me about the drilling actually, because when I was sort of read, reading through the notes, you know, you, you, one of your headlines was, you know, of the cost of the assays, you know, strong results. You talk about strong results, and again, <clears throat> this may be a more you know P, PGM thing. So if I look at you know eight point seven grams on uh, on average over a width of point seven seven of a meter or seventy seven centimeters, is that normal? Is that is that what you're chasing here? Is that how? Um, this this reef actually usually manifests itself, or, or can we expect to see you know wider intervals? Yeah, I think uh, uh, Matthew, uh, that is uh, what is so unique of a bushveld complex uh, in South Africa. Um, it's uh, it's an ore body, a tabular ore body, and uh, what we have on our property is specifically the two reefs, the Morensky Reef and the the UG Two Reef. And uh, these two reefs basically stretches, uh, you know, from the east, uh, running right through to the west. So it's it's tabular in nature, and uh, and there's a you know I think uh, a lot of questions regarding the bushveld and how do you mine it and and you know this is not the big the big kind of deposits or, or the diff, you know uh, the the more massive deposits that we see somewhere else. But of course, in South Africa, these deposits have been mined for many, many years and, and mined very successful. And I think in our case specifically, we or our property, like I said, which sits on the eastern limb of a bushveld complex, sits right there in between existing operations. So for us, the, um, you know, on the operating side, it's, it's, it's well known, the mining. We know exactly what we're going to do in terms of the processing industry. It's proven technology. So all of that is, is well known. And I think also, uh, what is very important is if we look at the barriers of entry of, uh, into platinum, of course, um, uh, you know, it's an established industry in South Africa. So there is, you know, the, the processing happening on the mine, but then there's also the downstream. Uh, beneficiation up to the final precious metals and all of that is is in South Africa. Now, if we look at 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 our resource and what what we have, we have in our prospectus uh, we announced that uh, we have in terms of ounces eighteen point eight million ounces uh, in uh, inferred resource, and then of course quite a significant uh, exploration target and. Uh, we announced that uh, in terms of our UG2 specifically, a grade of uh, as, um, uh, 7.7 grams per ton over a, a 70 centimeter uh, width. And uh, what we, we've seen now with our, our recent results is that in terms of grade, slightly higher and width also slightly higher. But, but again, I think, you know, it's, it's early days. Uh, you know, I mean, these, these, um, uh, numbers will, will certainly vary as we, as we get more, uh, results in. But what it tells us again is, is that, uh, we absolutely spot on in terms of our expectation, even if it's still a, an inferred resource. And some of these, these boreholes that we also drill two out of the three boreholes, um, that we got the assays back from is in exploration target area. And uh, of course, uh, exploration target in terms of category uh, still very low uh, in terms of confidence. But uh, what we've seen, we intersected uh, UG2 in, in that area and also excellent results. You know, the, the one borel that we got in the assay back on is 11 grams per ton. 
uh, you know, for that specific ball roll. So fantastic results. And uh, we, uh, we must say we're quite satisfied with that. Also, what is important for, for us and what was important was that um, the, uh, it was the first time for the property itself that we could actually get the, the pearl split. Now, the pearl split is basically your ratio of the uh, uh, four E's, which consists of platinum, palladium, rhodium, and gold. That ratio as a percentage of your um, of your grade that you that you declare, and again, you know, in terms of a pearl split, spot on. Uh, we've got a forty four percent platinum, forty five percent rhodium, nine percent forty five percent palladium, and nine percent uh, rhodium. And I think also very interesting to to note is that. If we look at the current prices with the high palladium and, and platinum, uh, 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 palladium and rhodium price, uh, our, our value contribution from uh, palladium and rhodium is quite significant. It is, uh, you know, in terms of those two metals, uh, you know, adding, uh, uh, you know, at, uh, you know, I think it was almost uh, 80% of uh, our value contribution currently. Um, so, so I think looking, looking ahead, certainly two metals that we're very pleased with to have in our basket and uh, uh, at the moment spot on in terms of our, our expectations. Okay, and, and tell me a little bit about the history of this because you know, I was asking about you know, where, where did you pick it up and you obviously said you've been invited in, but you, you're talking about an upgrade resource. There's obviously existing data there. Um, where, where did that come from? So what did you know when you were walking in this, into this thing? Presumably enough data gave you confidence to, to move into this thing. So what, 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 what did you inherit? Uh, Matthew, to, uh, yeah, to maybe take you back to, to your very first question, and that was the history and, and uh, you know, of this project. And as I said, we picked up this project way back in, in 2005 when we did the application. Unfortunately, you know, in 20, 2006, we did the application. 2007, uh, we had found out the news that it was uh, unfortunately awarded to a totally different group. Uh, and despite the fact that uh, this is a, a community that reside on, on the property and uh, according to the Minerals Act, uh, we're supposed to be awarded this prospecting right. We, um, what the, 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 uh, the company did, who the right was awarded to, uh, they went ahead and they uh, reversed their um, asset into a company called Nukwe. Nukwe went ahead and started drilling on the property. We got an interdict against uh, the company back then and uh, finally got them off the property after they drilled 27 borals. We went through a litigation process and um, which was finally then uh, decided in, in, in our favor and that judgment came out, uh, you know, with a resource, uh, with a uh, uh, right granted to us. So, so that was a, a bit of history. So, so uh, since then, we uh, did a lot of work uh, on the project itself. I think one was that we had these 27 borehole uh, data available, but also, uh, you know, if we look at, at, at what has been available in the market, uh, f uh, for us was, was, you know, on our eastern side, there was, was a, a company that uh, published reports. That data was available on the southern side and the northern side. So in the end, as, as, a, as a company, we could put together um, a geological model and a, and a geological structure that I think far exceeded the status for, for the project. So, so we went into this listing, uh, I think with, with confidence and, uh, we could see this now in the results that, that started to come out. Okay. And if you look at the, if you look at the, you talk about, um, obviously doing more drilling, I think it's 25,000 meter program, um, that, that, that you've talked about in, in your mat material. Yes, the, the resource upgrade, but also for feasibility, some sort of economic study here. So how, how many new meters have you or will you be drilling to add to that, um, feasibility study? Uh, yes. Uh, the, yeah, what we, the intention is that we have in total, uh, 38,000 meters that that we plan to drill and that we broke into two phases 
The one is phase one, and 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 that is in the order of just below uh, twenty four thousand uh, meters. And I'll tell you why. There's a slight difference to what we originally announced, and. Uh, so, so the intention, and, and we currently drilled, uh, you know, close to 5,000 meters out of that, that, uh, 24,000 meters. And what we've now realized, we just completed, uh, the 15th borehole. Uh, so 15 borehouse drilled. And what we, we started to see, uh, on the property is that, uh, you know, if you look at our original announcement, uh, we were under the impression that on the far eastern boundary of our property, there was an, an area which we weren't sure about. And, uh, we excluded that area from, from the, uh, original, uh, exploration target and infer. What we've now learned through, through this drilling, um, uh, is that, um, there is, there's certainly revet. So, uh, so that's an additional bonus for us in terms of our resource. So what, what we, what we've done was to, uh, remove some of our, uh, borals and move it into this, uh, uh, eastern, uh, area to, uh, to do more drilling, uh, drilling there. What we've also, uh, done with, uh, I mean, we had a, a lot of deflections. Uh, planned with our borehouse and uh, deflections basically, you know, drill down a borehole. And once you drill it, you, you drill into various areas, you know, uh, two, three deflections from that same borehole. And, uh, because there's not much variability within the Bushveld complex, we decided to, to, to reduce that, uh, deflections and then rather focus, uh, our drilling and do more, uh, exploratory drilling onto the eastern side. So there's quite a significant portion there that we will be able to add to our resource. Right, okay. And with regards to, uh, sorry, I want to be clear just in terms of semantics around it, that, that you're working towards a um, pre-feasibility study, not, not a feasibility study, yeah? Co- correct. And and what we, what we intend to do is with this drilling program is to convert uh, some of the current resource plus exploration target convert that into an indicated uh, uh, resource. And uh, and that's the whole intention. We need to get that into indicated that we can do our, our feasibility study and specifically pre-feasibility study on that. You, you, you got exactly where I was going. Okay, good. Um, it, it, so with the guys to, obviously, there's, there's a lot going on around you. You're obviously up in uh, northeast of uh, South Africa, uh, the Bushville complex. There's a lot going on there, a lot of, you know, a lot of... Um, Companies up there. Um, how? What sort of scale do you think you need to be able to show at pre-feasibility study to be kind of taken seriously? Do you know? Do you know what I mean? You know. You know what? How much of this is in your control uh, in terms of where this thing, the, the the scale of the opportunity in front of you? Uh, Matthew, you, yeah, they always say that uh, you know your whole body dictates your your scale of your your mind. Now, uh, typically in South Africa, if we look at, at sur- our surrounding areas, and again, you know, it's, it's available to us. And you look at, at our strike length, which is, uh, you know, in the order of four, uh, 4,500 meters, uh, you know, on the eastern side. Uh, and, uh, so that will typically, if we, if we look at, at, at the industry and the mines around us, will sustain a, uh, a mine in the order of 150 to 170,000 tons per month or in the order of 12 million tons per annum. Uh, and uh, uh, so that is more or less a scale that, that we will look at. And in, of course, in terms of ounces, uh, and that is four E's, uh, in the order of, uh, you know, 250,000 ounces uh, per annum. Uh, of course, I must add that although we report these things as 4E, that's no, there's sort of an industry norm here. Uh, like I mentioned, uh, you know, there's also uh, the other three uh, uh, PGMs, ruthenium, iridium, and osmium, uh, that, that's in our ore body, uh, nickel, copper, and uh, chrome also, which is quite a significant byproduct contributor 
to our uh, potential revenue stream. Right. Okay. And in, in terms of um, obviously raised 19 million in IPO, and, and you had a little bit of money before that chucked in. We, was there? We, we had an initial, uh, yeah, pre-IPO uh, raise of 1.65 million. Okay. Uh, so okay. Yeah, that's right. And so that's, you just get, get, get the wheels turning, as uh, as it were. Yeah, um, so by at the end of this two, year, sorry. When, how long will the, the, the money last you in, in terms of this two-year program or even if you bring it slightly, slightly forward? Matthew, I think we, we're quite fortunate that, uh, you know, we sit with a strong balance sheet, uh, you know, to, to have been able to raise 19 million uh, Australian dollar for us was, was absolutely fantastic. And uh, if we look at, at, you know, after listing and, and you know, uh, we had uh, just north of uh, 17 million Australian dollars uh, in the bank. And uh, if you look at, at where we sit now, end of November, uh, there's still a significant amount left uh, in the order of 15 million. And, uh, and that will take us through next year. So, uh, you know, we are very, very fortunate as a junior to sit with a very strong balance sheet to take us through this exploration uh, plan. Okay, Johan, I, I, that's a really nice introduction to, to your company and your plans. So lots of drilling, lots of news, um, you know, ho- hopefully with, 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 with good results for, for next year. Um, we'd love to stay in touch with this story. So um, please uh, come back on um, when you've got some news and we'll speak to you again soon. Thank you, Matthew. And uh, yeah, thank you for hosting us. And uh, certainly, you know, if we think this year was an exciting time and the full year, I think next year, there's a lot on our, our uh, plate and uh, we're looking forward to that. Thank you very much.